A big welcome to everybody. We're so happy that so many of you could join us. We had close to 1,000 people registering, um, so it, there might be quite a bit of a, a to and fro coming in between now and the end. But again, big welcome to everybody. I am Mariana Matsukato. I am a professor in the Economics of Innovation and Public Value at the University College London, where I founded an Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, which is a full-blown department, uh, where two of our speakers tonight are actually honorary professors, both Hillary and Carlotta. And we're incredibly happy to welcome both Imandeep Kaur, who we call Imi, and Anne-Marie Slaughter to the Institute. Uh, Anne-Marie is actually a friend from Princeton. We were reminiscing about our equally chaotic households in the area. Uh, a longer intro to each of them in a couple of minutes. Uh, today's discussion is extremely relevant to the time we're living through. It's a time of massive social and economic upheaval where so many people and, in, um, and institutions in both the public and private spheres seem to have you know, really been completely unprepared. Uh, but this moment of unpreparedness was just as true, of course, before COVID hit. We seem to be going through moments of being unprepared constantly from one type of crisis to another. The 2008 financial crisis, not so long ago, which many countries have still to get over. The climate crisis, we shouldn't forget that just in January and February, we were all clapping, not healthcare workers, but firefighters and flood workers in places like Venice, California, Australia, and now a massive global health pandemic. And all of these crises, crises are actually quite interlinked and they have strong systemic causes and hence need systemic responses. And this really means at the core, understanding the underlying structures and relationships that lead to systems failure. And, and so often in all the different types of institutions and organizations in our economy and society at large and the relationships between them and what kind of redesign of both the organizations but especially the relationships between them because there is indeed nothing deterministic about the current system we have it's an outcome of the choices that we make on the ground organizations and institutions are governed that is just as true in the public and private sphere um, and they also again relate to one another and those relationships at the core have contracts and they have relationships which can be unpicked and experimented in new ways. So I really hope that tonight is a moment also of experimentation where we also reflect on global experiences, but also regional experiences and practical experiences and what we can learn from them in terms of how to react to moments that actually require massive change. So the discussion tonight is using a report written by Hilary Cotton, who is an honorary professor in the Institute for innovation and public purpose, which investigates big changes that we actually need in our welfare states. And I think it's really important to do something that Hillary reminded me yesterday in a phone call we had, which is she said, you know, don't forget, there's many different types of welfare states. Um, there's many different decisions that actually then affect what kind of welfare state we have. And globally, there's very different um, form. So we shouldn't use that word as though it's some sort of abstract entity. It's very much something that can change and emerge depending on exactly conversations like this one. Um, and IPP, actually, what's been interesting in the last months is we've been part of quite a few COVID task forces around the world, uh, both with organizations like the Vatican, but also in countries as different as South Africa and Italy. And it's been quite incredible, actually, <laughs> to see, as Hillary says, the very different types of responses in different countries, including in terms of their health systems, which is, of course, an essential part of a welfare state, uh, you know, public education, public transport, uh, public health. And we were, you know, very interested in speaking to people in Vietnam and Kerala, for example, in India, which actually, interestingly, did a lot better uh, in reacting to this crisis than many advanced industrialized economies. And this had a lot to do with, again, decisions that were made on the ground over the last decade about what you actually even want in your public administration and the investments that are required in order to build what we call in IPP the dynamic capabilities and capacity within the state itself. So the capacity and capabilities also within the welfare state. And um, just lastly, one point I want to make, which is I think quite important as an overall also uh, ambition and umbrella uh, for what IPP does in this area, it's, it's quite striking how there's often this dichotomy in the conversations we have around the economy. There's, you know, those conversations about wealth creation and those very quickly go to areas like entrepreneurship, innovation, 
dynamism, creativity, those are adjectives we use, and then other ones that are about redistributing that wealth. And there we talk again about redistribution, the role of the state, uh, fixing market failures, and the welfare state is more in the latter conversation. And I think one very interesting result perhaps of Hillary's work and how it's interacting with our work inside the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose is to really upset that dichotomy. How we actually structure the welfare state and reimagine what it's even for can fundamentally affect how we create value in the first place, not just how we redistribute it. Um, anyway, I, I don't wanna keep speaking because that could go on forever. So uh, back to the point of this evening, uh, we're really here to celebrate this fantastic new report that Hillary's written, Welfare 5.0, why we need a social revolution and how to make it happen. I think it's already on the IAPP website, if not from tomorrow. And basically the report urges that investment is needed to create a new social settlement, one that can actually address the very different social, economic, technological, and ecologic, uh, ecological crises of today and why this is not a linear or static process, it's why we need to experiment and experiment and be really open to learning what works, what doesn't, and to put humans at the center. Um, and it's a huge pleasure to now introduce to you uh, the speakers. It's a really stellar all-woman uh, uh, panel. So Hillary herself is an internationally acclaimed social entrepreneur, working globally with communities and governments to design collaborative, affordable solutions to big social challenges. Her fantastic book, Radical Help, has made big waves across the world. And as mentioned, she is an honorary professor with us. These are all quite short bios. Uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter is the CEO of New America and a professor emeritus of politics and international affairs at Princeton University. She's also been a director at the US State Department and a professor at Harvard Law School. Carlota Perez is a pioneering scholar on the role of innovation and an honorary professor at IPP. And her work focuses on the socioeconomic impact of technical change and the historical context of growth and development. And Imandeep Kaur, uh, who I will from now on be calling Imi, is a co-founder and director of Civic Square, based in Birmingham, England. Civic Square is a public square, a neighborhood lab and participatory platform rolled into one. And its focus is on regenerative civic and social infrastructures. And what's actually quite extraordinary is that all these people, including myself, have worked with Hillary. So this is gonna be in some ways a fest of friends talking about Hillary's uh, grand opus and what will happen next with it because it's very much about changing practice. Uh, so in terms of what happens next over the next hour or so, is Hillary will spend about 20 minutes presenting her report, and then I will ask each of our speakers to respond briefly to it. We'll then have a discussion between ourselves, and then I'll open it up for about 15 minutes at the end to Q&A from the audience. And that is gonna be coming through a, a person here at IAPP who will have to sift through some of the questions. We obviously cannot respond to them all. And IAPP will be live tweeting the event, so everyone can follow us on at IAPP underscore UCL. And the hashtag is hashtag IIPP welfare revolution altogether. Um, and you can send in questions and comments using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. And as I mentioned, there'll be an intermediator because we cannot answer them all. So without further ado, I will ask Hillary now to uh, begin her presentation. And I think you have slides, Hillary, so you can share your screen. Hello, everybody. And um, Mariana, thank you for such a, a great introduction. Um, tonight is about the urgent need to rethink our social systems and we are talking in the midst of this pandemic which has ripped through our communities and our nations. We've lost many, many who are dear to those of us who are here this evening and also we know it's not over. I mean it's escalating again in the UK and that's not the only place. And we've seen really importantly, the way that the burden hasn't fallen equally. So the pandemic has brutally exposed inequalities, injustices and the frailties within our society, as Mariana was saying. And I think this conversation has led to, um, well, the crisis has led to a very big and growing conversation about the need to rethink or move beyond capitalism as we know it. And much of the most exciting work on this need for reinvention, of course, is happening right here at IIPP, led by Mariana and her colleagues, including Carlotta. Um, but 
far less attention actually has been paid globally to the urgent need to rethink our social systems, which is odd and actually, I think, problematic because without this social rethink, any wider reinvention of our economic or ecological path is, I think, almost certainly bound to fail. So the intention of the paper, which has been very collaborative in its making, is to stimulate this conversation about how to rethink our social systems. And I'm going to talk this evening briefly about why it's important, what the social revolution might look like, and then importantly, how we can make it happen in practice. But first of all, I just want to say how honoured I am to be here at IIPP, uh, to be an honorary professor, to have Marianne in the chair, and to be joined by Carlotta and Marie and Imi, uh, whose work all of the work, your work has been so important. I admire you so much and all of you have helped with the paper. So it, it is kind of quite extraordinary and, and I'm very honoured. And I'm also honoured that, you know, nearly a thousand people are joining online because I think it shows about the urgency and the interest and the importance of what we're going to discuss this evening. So what should a welfare state look like? What would be a 5.0 system? Um, and I think it needs to do three things. First of all, we have to tell a new story. We have to offer a vision about a more equitable future that has a kind of concrete response to the experience of unpredictability and precarity that is most people in the world's daily norm. Secondly, I think we have to enable transition. So in the short term, this is about the shocks that uh, will inevitably follow from this pandemic, but also about the need to move towards a green future in which there are new forms of well-paid work and production within the boundaries of what the planet can support. And then thirdly, we have to be able to talk about and address the deeper legacy challenges. So these are the structural, spatial, racial, socioeconomic divisions that harm us and hold us back. So I'm going to talk about all of this this evening, but first of all, the question always is, why Welfare 5.0? And that's because I think that technology is a centrifugal force which shapes our economy, our use of natural resources, our social lives, and that technology revolutions create the possibility of social revolutions on a global scale. And history shows that in some way, not that technology determines it, but social systems have to adapt. That's going to happen. So the question is how we shape it. And according to Carlotta's groundbreaking scholarship, which I draw on in the paper and in the work that I do, um, we are currently in a digital revolution, which started in 1971. Carlotta, you'll tell me the bits that I've not got right. But this is the world's fifth technology revolution. So it needs a sibling social revolution, hence Welfare, welfare 5.0. Let's start briefly with the crisis, because the reality, of course, is that before the pandemic, as Mariana said, everything was not fine and the troubles we've seen, in fact, aren't new. We know they're there. Um, and that the welfare systems that we have, which were designed to confront the challenges of a previous mass production era, are struggling, which is partly about funding. It's very much about funding, but it's not about funding alone, because the fact is that the social systems were designed to deal with occasional troubles, not the endemic consequences that we're seeing as the result of living in societies where there is persistent and deepening inequality. Our systems are also struggling with modern challenges from the new illnesses of the mind to the fact that we need to have very different learning systems in this technology revolution. And too many people really are living lives that have nothing to do with national stories of GDP growth or prosperity. And we're seeing everywhere the political consequences of that, very much in the three nations that, that we represent here this evening. And in this context, the work of, and talents of committed carers, teachers, public servants, can't compensate however great our public servants are and our public workers are they can't do enough to compensate for something which is much deeper and that is about relying on a set of designs rules and norms that are out of step with modern lives and modern troubles so what i want to emphasize this evening is that our social systems are in crisis because they can't address modern suffering but also because they're deeply interconnected, as Mariana again alluded to, to economic, political and ecological systems, which are also in trouble. And although this might sound very obvious, I mean, I've been kind of in the work of sort of community development, social revolution for many decades. And it's almost always the case that we underestimate the impact of those other systems. And people try to talk about how to reform social systems as if they're in isolation from, from bigger kind of economic, ecological and, so, and, and structures. And so that's sort of placed outside the frame of reference. And this paper is very much about bringing that back in. Um, so when we see this kind of shift, which is the uh, FT um, editorial from April the 3rd, where uh, the FT said that they had realised that the virus had laid bare the frailty of the social contract. And importantly, what they argued for in this editorial was that 
in order to address this, we have to stop seeing social spending as a cost. We have to start seeing it as an investment. It's an exciting moment, but it also leads us to question, okay, invest, but invest in what? Because we can't invest in systems that were designed for a different era. And I think the first thing we have to do is say, okay, what's the vision? And the vision I'm proposing is one of wealth. But the word wealth actually is an Anglo-Saxon word, which means the advancement of the richness of all life and all lives. So as I outline in the paper, this is a purpose that encompasses fair and decent standards of living, support that enables each and every one of us to develop across a broad range of dimensions about being creative, relational, purposeful human beings who are deeply connected to one another and our wider environments. It's also about not um, allowing some systems to grow, which has very much happened in the British welfare state, on the backs of work of other people in other places who we usually can't see and are kind of suffering in order to provide the services that we need. And wealth in this way is talking about a very modern form of flourishing, which I think has Aristotelian roots because um, it understands that our dignity and development are rooted in very collective participation in the wider structures of society, the home, the market, the community and the state. And what we need is a redesign of those institutions to make deep participation a living and breathing reality. So existing systems are all about advancing the economy in which human lives and they're geared to make sure that we can keep growing that economy. 5.0 systems are about the purpose of the economy, which is to advance the richness of human life and all life, ecological life. So then you understand that we have to work and the systems understand that we have to work with wider social, ecological, economic and political futures, which are all entwined. So to create, uh, I propose in the paper that to create these systems, we have to have a set of design principles. We need a design pattern, what I call a social code that can guide collective making and repurposing. So the post-war mass production welfare state had this very famous blueprint. This is the beverage uh, report, which was translated into 22 languages. It obviously was the blueprint for, for the British welfare state, but also influenced the design of welfare systems all across the world. Beverage immediately flew to the US and had conversations with Roosevelt. And I absolutely love it that this report says not to be taken away. It kind of absolutely encapsulates the idea of the blueprint, which is you can't borrow it, you can't use it, you just have to read it and follow the rules. Um, and what we've seen is that that kind of blueprint really doesn't work for now. Um, we've seen um, very much in this pandemic the way that these kind of very centralised rule-based systems have really struggled, whether it's the kind of supermarket where the shelves aren't stocked but the local store has food, or whether it's kind of mass production health systems which have really struggled um, despite the brilliance of, of workers within those systems to kind of procure PPE to take care of people and so on, whereas we've seen local communities kind of really work spontaneously to do that. So it's obvious that we need a different kind of pattern and I propose a, a, digital, a social code because I think that kind of idea brings us much closer culturally to the idea of a digital code, which is something we can use, remake, repurpose, and so on. And in the paper, I, I, I propose five principles of this social code. And I think that each of these principles are a bit like a piece of a jigsaw, so they all have edges to interconnect, and they form the questions that we need to answer. And that question is definitely not how could we improve X or Y service. It's a much bigger one, which is is this investment, this activity, this redesign or innovation generative for people and for planet? And will it further our collective flourishing? And will it offer the greatest support to those who are most vulnerable and need it most? So just, I mean, we haven't got time to go into them all in depth this evening, and, and I hope people will read the paper and I hope they'll send me comments. But if we think about the first principle, which is about us, humanity, we can think about that every, uh, every pattern we have is fashioned on a human at its center. So if we think about a dress pattern to design an item of clothing, it has this human body at the center. And our existing welfare states are also modeled and corrected on a human form, which is the imagined homo economicus. I think everybody here knows him, the solitary calculating maximizing man. And he has this dastardly cousin who is uh, popularized by Richard Dawkins, a selfish gene, and this cousin, by the way, somebody's already asked a question about this. This cousin is the reason why so much resource in our systems has to be spent policing the actually almost negligible number of people who try to cheat because we think that everybody's selfish and they might want to cheat. 
In fact, I think it's really important that both these characters aren't supported by developments in academia across a whole range of disciplines, from biology to philosophy, psychology to neuroscience, because we understand now, and actually, of course, what's really important is the pandemic has taught us all viscerally, that we are all connected. There is no such thing as the independent organism or person who can maximize for themselves. There's no such thing as a separate environment. Um, and so our social designs, I think, are really stuck because they're designed around this idea of this discrete individual who's trying to look after themselves and has a set of parts that kind of at some point might need to be fixed and also might cheat. That's very important. So I think we can only grow adaptive generative systems with a new template. And I start instead by replacing Homo economicus with this idea of sapiens integra. So sapiens integra is somebody who works, cares, loves, plays, learns for pleasure. She grows, she competes, sometimes she suffers. She's a person I've been developing through numerous conversations and in particular in collaboration with Anne-Marie. So it's fantastic that Anne-Marie is here because this draws very much on her work. And I think the most important thing about Sapiens Integra is that she understands that we become who we are through relationships to others. We're like trees. We become kind of individually stronger when our roots interconnect with the roots of other trees. So whilst Homo economicus had to kind of try and maximize their individual utility, Sapiens Integra is all about growing capability, her own capability, but also that of her networks, which leads to the kind of second point about capability. So a capability describes something we can do or be, and it describes also, I think, what's really important. It's not an output, it's our potential becoming with the right kind of support. And of course, this work is deeply rooted in, in the philosophy of, of Amartya Sen and, and Martha Nussbaum. And um, at the heart of the capability approach is this really simple question, which is, what can I really be and do? And so it brings into frame what we've been told, what society tells us we can do, our emotions, our feelings, but also the very concrete structures around us. Do we live in a place, for example, where there's good work? It's about power. It's about understanding and structuring questions around those, those kind of really nitty gritty issues. And in the paper, I propose that we focus on five capabilities without which we can't flourish in this century. Learning, work, health, physical and mental, relationships, which I think is probably the most important, and community. Um, so growing capability, of course, needs resource. And part of the, uh, so the third sort of point of the social code is the social economy, which I really hope um, we can spend some time discussing this evening. Because I think that for a long time, the rethink of our social systems has been denied on the grounds of an economic orthodoxy that basically uh, it's a short term cost. There's just not enough money. We can't invest. But a series of systemic failures, which, as Mariana, Mariana said, COVID is just one of the latest and we know more are to come, has shown the kind of fallacy of these kind of models. And of course, the discipline of economics is now undergoing a very rapid and radical change led in no small part by IIPP and Mariana and her colleagues. And I think we can see this very exciting new orthodoxy emerging. So the new orthodoxy involves um, recovering work that's been long admired but kind of relegated to the margins so i think of work like that of um, ostrom on the commons i think of all the feminist studies on the value of care and household work it's about repositioning economic policy and business strategy around uh, notions of value and purpose and of course mariana's work has led the way there it's about the groundbreaking analysis that carlotta has made about the connections between technology revolutions and the possibility of smart green growth and it's also about what I would call the economics of emergence, which understands that there can't be any sustainable economy that privileges growth above the ecological boundaries of the planet. And I cite various sources here, but I think the work of Kate Rayworth, who's also kind of come to IIPP to talk and share her work, is really important. And so the design of the new welfare systems connects to this orthodoxy in two important ways. So firstly, I think that we see the interdependence of economic and social systems, which again is something Mariana just alluded to. So we can't think about or design or endorse economic systems that are extractive of people and planet and think somehow that we can then have a welfare state that afterwards comes along and stitches us back together. 5.0's thinking has to be kind of much more symbiotic and it's about understanding that those interconnections have to be there from the start. If we don't invest in learning, we can't think differently about how a new economy can grow, for example. And in the paper, I talk about these interdependencies in more depth. But the second point I want to highlight this evening is that the social economy, social systems that further capabilities, 
are rooted in relationships. And this does require a particular economic condition to take root, to grow and be sustained. And it requires a particular set of institutions. So this doesn't mean more expensive. Actually, um, very often it means less expensive because if we fix things when they're broken, that costs a lot. But if we actually nurture humans from the outset, that is a very different kind of way of going about it and often costs much less, although I don't want to kind of justify it on the grounds of cost. But it does mean that certain conditions are required. I think one of those is that we have a very different definition of resource that combines not just money, public and private, but time, skills, relationships and so on. But it also, I think, um, and perhaps controversially, means that we have to understand that institutions that support us socially are not institutions where we can extract a surplus. If there is a surplus, it has to be reinvested. So we have to see the end of the type of model that we have in the UK, for example, where children's homes are actually just part of a portfolio uh, of property companies that are flipped by private equity uh, companies with some of the worst outcomes for looked after children in the world. Instead, we have to think about emerging, emerging models of employee ownership, um, we think of things like Bootsorg, for example, and also really importantly, new values based state models which are emerging all over Britain. I can think of the work in, in North Ayrshire, for example, on this. And these foundational principles, this very different non extractive uh, commoning way of working means that we have to have different forms of benchmarking and different forms of institution. And so these new institutions are horizontal, they're networked, it's the fourth principle in the paper. They're characterised by very different forms of leadership, by being able to kind of harness the energy that is in social movements, they're open, they're porous, they draw on deep history as well as practical experience. And also they're very local, because the fifth critical principle is about being things being made through practice. It's about experimentation and making and doing. So I've already talked about how we can't think any longer about um, in terms of blueprints or, or mass production. Um, things that can be scaled and kind of printed and, 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 and sort of rolled out from the center regardless of context. This is a design code and design is about making. So we need new tools to collaborate, to assemble, to reassemble. Um, the kind of work we've actually seen emerging spontaneously in this pandemic are people have come together to help each other in very different ways. Um, also the kind of work that IMI has pioneered in this country, um, in Birmingham, um, through the hub and now Civic Square. And that's why I'm, I'm so kind of really happy, IMI, that you're with us this evening to kind of share that. Of course, this sharing of tools and components and, and of organisations um, the idea that things can be kind of disassembled and reassembled is something very logical and accessible in the digital age. But I want to kind of draw a really important distinction between, let's say, a kind of digital health app, for example, that sits in the cloud and it kind of harvests our data and then it kind of feeds us back uh, other data, which actually kind of just serves to sort of distance us from our kind of bodies and our communities, as opposed to kind of tools that are in our hands, as you see kind of here in this workshop, a workshop that I've been running recently on new institutions. Um, that we can use, that we can develop, and that we can kind of design things according to the principles, but that really work for us in kind of local context. Um, I also think just to kind of say another really important part is that this power of making, um, which we talk a lot about, is um, about disrupting the hierarchies of knowledge. We need many different disciplines to kind of address the problems we have. We need experts, academics, lived experience, modern movements, as I've said, but also we need a new way of working that combines this in kind of in new ways beyond the kind of hierarchies of what knowledge counts that are currently very prevalent. And I do think kind of hold back social change as I discussed in the paper. So finally, let's talk about making this happen. Um, so the first thing I think that's really important to say is we've done it before. Uh, we have inherited, although they don't work now, unbelievable social settlements, social systems that in their day, particularly in Western Europe, utterly transformed the life chances of people who were born in those countries. And what was important is that those uh, systems that are threadbare now, but we inherited, were built um, on the back of a war in bombed out cities with people who were still suffering from the recession of the 1930s who were out of work and yet our leaders, our populations, we dreamt big and we made it happen. So we know we can do it. We know it's not an empty dream. That's the first thing. The second thing I think is really important is that we can reuse, that not everything has to be new and this is what happened in the last um, 
the last revolution, the, the beverage welfare state, is that he basically published a list of principles. And if you wanted to be paid and you wanted to be supported, you had to be part of those new principles. And we know, for example, that doctors really didn't like it. They came into the NHS often very much against their will, but that was the direction of travel. And that's what we need to do now, because the work that I'm talking about, probably all the kind of thousand people who are here joining us this evening are doing this work every single day. But at the moment, it's against the odds, it's against the system. And we have to find a way through using the code to move the resource in that direction. But drawing on history, I think, um, and to sort of conclude really, um, my kind of summary, but to open up the discussion, I think that we can see that four groups are really needed if we're going to make a revolution. So the first group are those I call the organic intellectuals. Um, I call them that in a kind of Gramscian sense, because I think it's partly about academia, but it's not all academics. And it's also about people creating kind of big thinking and new ideas outside of academia. But the point is, we need new rigorous ideas, which inspire global imaginations, are rooted in practice and come from all different disciplines, science, design, history, economics, anthropology, and so on. The second is that we need organized civil society, artists, movement makers, activists, unionists, People who bring creativity, knowledge, lived experience, who, who know and live every day another way. The third group are a group that I'm particularly interested in, a group I call the new industrialists. I think um, that business leaders are really critical and perhaps because uh, sort of the agitation for social change often comes from the left, there's come sometimes a kind of quite complex relationship with this group. But if we look at history and we look at Carlotta's work, what we can see is that it's at the moment that those who are leaders of the new technology business, whatever it is, at the moment that they begin to think differently about a social settlement, change can begin to happen. And it's really important here that I'm not talking about philanthropy. I'm actually not interested in philanthropy. I'm not interested in a society where some people get rich and then they reinvest it in kind of good social solutions. I'm interested in how we come to the recognition that the social, the economic and the ecological, the political are together and we move all those systems through together. So, I mean, somebody I talk about often is Henry Ford. He wasn't a very nice man. He shot his workers, but he realised that he had to kind of adjust the conditions of his workers if the economy was to move forward. And he fought his board in order to kind of find different conditions and pay for his workers. Obviously, I'm not advocating shooting anybody. This is a velvet revolution. And then the fourth group, which is really critical, is the state. We need a new generation of leaders. I think we can see them, perhaps not in the central state in any of our countries, but definitely locally, who will dare to forge new alliances and design new frameworks. And the state is required to play a very unique and strong role. In Radical Help, in my book, Radical Help, I talk about you know, the state as the kind of head gardener who has to develop the framework, lay out the conditions, the guidelines for public investment, and ensure that kind of all public endeavor kind of flows in that direction. It has to empower those who are in incumbent state systems at the moment, who are desperately, as I said, trying to change things within structures and um, systems that are very kind of vertically organized and in which it's very difficult to make change. And I think that the state is critical and it's also one of the challenges because we can't underestimate, you know, the fact that the state currently is this mass production organization that really needs to undergo its own cultural and organizational revolution to play its part. But I do think in the light of the pandemic, we can really see that fissures have taken place. I work mainly with local government and really extraordinary things have started to happen in you know, East Ayrshire, North Ayrshire, Barrow, Wigan, I could talk about it. And I'm sure that Anne-Marie can talk about the US and Carlotta, we can talk about Venezuela, which is a particularly critical case. Um, but we can see the need for this kind of, uh, this new role of the state and a relational reset between state and business. So I think the possibility is immediate to kind of finance state support. And I talk about this in terms of practical examples, which we can go into later about the fact that the state is spending now and how it can spend to have new norms around wage ratios, to begin to kind of support people into new green jobs, to kind of rethink the university in that context. Many, many things that are widely perceived at the moment as a bailout or a a possible bailout could be really thought in terms of the kind of transition that 5.0 systems are about. Before the pandemic, I was working in communities across Britain with all different types of workers from different walks of life, supported by the Soros Foundation, exploring what a good working life looks like and what new forms of institution we need. The imagination was immense, and this evening isn't about that, but also was this incredible 
under sort of visceral, powerful thrum like a drumbeat that everybody is living this very precarious life. And that the systems that are there aren't the right systems. They're not supportive. They can often be very punitive. They're in the wrong place. They're not working in the right way. As I say, despite, you know, those who are working in these systems know this and are trying to change it. Um, and there's also not a feeling that the systems we have are actually going to last. So I think that this is the kind of reality. The reality is not a kind of smooth life in which every now and again we might need a social system. The reality is lives of constant emotional work, relational change that need different forms of support. And this is a really painful moment of disruption. But I think it is also a very profound opportunity to live differently, to address injustice, to restore ecological balance and to flourish. And it's one I think all of us, I wish I could see everybody, but all of us here are waiting for. And, um, and I'm really excited we're going to discuss it this evening. So, so thank you. Thank you, Hilary. Wow, what a, what a fantastic tour de force. Um, really amazing how you often go constantly between the practical, the theoretical, the framing. Uh, so much to discuss, just quickly, in case people don't realize how bad the situation is, just in terms of numbers around the private uh, equity issue, 50,000 uh, care beds are currently run by private equity companies in the UK. So, you know, we often say in IPP, finance isn't neutral. And the fact that we have this very problematic, as, as Hillary was saying, extractive form of finance, uh, financing such an essential part of our welfare state, which globally ended up on its knees, you know, really should open up huge amounts of questions also there. But thank you so much. And I really do encourage everyone to actually read the paper because Hillary did us a great service of whizzing through it with these great colorful PowerPoints, but uh, please do read it. And as Hillary said, um, open for comments. I don't know, Hillary, if you wanna let people know how you want to receive those comments, if you're telling people your, your email or how, but perhaps we can do that towards the end. When yes, that would be steps. great, yeah. yeah. You can think about which email to share. Uh, your husband's, that's always a good choice. Uh, okay, so Carlotta, your work has been absolutely critical for uh, global thinkers and doers in, in all sorts of sectors, both public, private, third sector. You're asked to speak globally about the relationship between the social, the economic, the technological. Uh, your book, Technological Revolutions and Finance Capital, is, has been extraordinary again, and how it looks at the co-evolution uh, within a revolution between production, finance, and then the social structures around that. So we're, we're really keen to hear your contribution. I know you asked to do this via slides, which is great. So if you want to share your screen, that's fine. I want to start, first of all, by yeah. saying yeah. how wonderful I think uh, Hillary's report is, because many people have many brilliant ideas, but not all of them have spent more than 20 years, maybe 40 years, actually doing what, they, what they're talking about, actually testing it out and finding failures and successes, but, but in real life. So everything that Hillary says, all her wisdom comes from practice, and that's very rare. I mean, because we've divided people into academics and whatever, activists and whatever, but people who can both do and think and all that, very rare. So first of all, congratulations. I'm very happy about this report and I'm very proud that I am part of the inspiration for it. Because in fact, uh, you know what Hillary is saying is not a dream. It's actually an absolute necessity, not just because we think morally that it's, ne that it's needed, it's because the capitalist system needs that transformation and it has happened each time with every technological revolution. In fact, the, the mass production revolution, which began in the 20s, uh, went through this horrendous 1930s and then went through a horrendous war and only after all that did it realize that it couldn't continue without setting up a welfare state. And it was the welfare state that created the demand, that created the whole of the golden age, which we could have ahead of us now if we were to pay attention to Hillary and to all the other things that Mariana has been saying. We've all been, we're actually IITP, is about this necessary transformation. So what I would like to do today is to actually connect all those things and see how the need for the welfare 5.0 that Hillary talks about 
is embedded in a much bigger need because innovation, whether it's social or technological, has a particular way of being. And that particular way of being, I'm going to try to explain to you today because I think it's very useful for us to understand why and how to face these big transformations. So now I am going to share my screen. I wanted to tell you that at the beginning, all innovations, whether they're technical or social, are enveloped in the past. What you see here is a horseless carriage. It's the first sort of automobile. I mean, there were many, this is one of the many models. But as you see, it's still as if it were a horse carriage. In fact, the, we are still measuring the, horse, the engines by horsepower. So of course, you know, you couldn't really get a proper automobile to begin with because you're, you're in a system that doesn't have the capacity to build the automobile that would happen in the future for everybody's transformation. So what happened in 1913, which is actually about 30 years after the automobile was invented, that Ford designed with mass production an automobile that could actually be for everybody, that could actually replace bicycles, I mean, unfortunately, but, but fortunately in another way, and replace uh, even trains and the whole thing. So it's a big change in society, but it took a long time to go from one to the other. Many complementary innovations are, are always needed to shape the future. Social, technical, whatever we're doing, there is this change. And in this particular case, it was the way of producing that changed the automobile. It wasn't just another design. Of course, it was also covered and, you know, a different thing, but it was mainly a social innovation that allowed the automobile to become what it was to become in the future. And it took 27 years to go from a walkie-talkie, which is a military thing, to our current computer phone, which is the, the uh, you know, the real change. Uh, the other thing that's very important to understand is where the jobs come from in each revolution, because every revolution destroys a lot of jobs. Well, what happens is that each revolution enables a different lifestyle and creates new jobs. But most importantly for our social questions, is that each golden age changes values and redefines the aspirational good life. So when we think of the welfare state, we're not thinking of creating again the American way of life. We're thinking of maybe a better life than that one. Maybe we can aspire to a better model of life. So the second technological revolution was the first big cities, the urbanization one, which brought Victorian living, the bourgeois home, which was for the, for the new bourgeoisie, was between the aristocratic country house and what were still the crowded tenements and the poor house. So that was not very good in social terms. There was very little advance. There was a bit of advance then. Then we come to the first globalization in the third revolution, where we have cosmopolitan living of the Belle Epoque. And the good life then was outside. It was about restaurants, cafes, pubs, theaters, music halls, sports, games, you know, the whole community activities. It was very much in all social levels, there was a lot of outside community and so on. So what happens with the fourth revolution? We come to self-contained family living. So now all entertainment was in the TV and the radio and the records and the, and the kitchen. We didn't go to the restaurant because we now had the, the kitchen and the thing and we didn't go to the, to the place where they wash the things because we had the machines. And the whole, the home became the central. So the rich were invisible. The great majorities aspired to the American way of life with home ownership and mass consumption. And it was very much this possession obsessed society, but it made a huge difference for all the workers to actually have this amount of comfort that could only be dreamed of a uh, hundred years before. Now the current fifth digital revolution can restore both individual meaning and community links. Of course, part of the community links are over internet. But the whole notion 
you know, now the bicycles and the things and the sports and the running out and doing, you know, there is a new way of looking at life and at values. Nobody thinks that sitting as a couch potato watching TV is what we want. It's not a question of just possessions. It's a question of meaning, meaning of meaningful jobs, meaningful relationships. All these things have become much more important with this particular revolution because the values have been changing and they will change more. But there is another very important thing that we have to understand. For decades, that horseless carriage that I showed you continued as an ever more expensive rich man's luxury. So all these cars, you know, really expensive, were, um, you know, it looked like that was the direction that you were supposed to go. And in fact, at the same time, it was a chaotic jumble of people, horses and cars uh, that shared the unregulated urban space. So there were, we needed to conceive of the automobile as something different and we needed to regulate so that everything could work decently with the sidewalks and the things and the rules and get the horses out of the way and so on. So the new life, but the thing is, it was very expensive and it was very chaotic. Well, our current welfare system is very expensive because it is obsolete, chaotic, and inadequate. I'm going to give you an example that you might not believe. If we take the market genie of Germany, the genie which is a measure of inequality, if we take before the taxes and the transfers and all that, that precisely before the welfare state and the taxes, what we have is that during Keynesian times in the 60s and 70s in Germany, the, Gini was, the, G, the uh, market genie was around 42%. Now it's as bad as Chile. Chile, you know, Latin America is famous for the bad inequality, for the high inequality. It's actually higher, about 52. Guess why? Because of the free market. So this is really a horrendous situation. And yet we know that Germany is certainly not like Chile, of course, because of the welfare state, the redistribution. So if we take, this is still the market genie, the one before in another scale. And now we have here the disposable income genie, which is what people actually have. Now look at this. It's around 30, just below 30 all the time with even an improvement in the middle. But you know what? The gap being covered by the state, by the welfare state, used to be 28%. It is now 44% gap. It's an enormous gap to come down from 52 to 30, where it used to be 38 to 30 something. So actually, it's a very expensive and not very fantastic system, even with all that expense. But that money could be used for innovation, could be used for investment, could be used for infrastructure, could be used for all sorts of things. But it's because the model, the, the, the conditions are made so that there is inequality, so that there are incredibly high salaries at the top amazing millions per month. I mean, what do you do with millions per month? Whereas on the other side, we have the essential people who are getting so little. So we need to improve pre-distribution radically so we reduce the need for such a high redistributed welfare. Of course, Hillary's uh, accent is not on money. You know, it isn't about changing income, but we do need to do it anyway, but it's about changing lives. So of course, some of the current social problems are the result of technological creative destruction, which is one of the things that has to be responded to, but the others resulted from austerity and the neoliberal policies. So to go from welfare 4.0 to welfare 5.0, we cannot keep the idea that it's about income only. We need an inclusive economy that empowers more people, leaves less people behind, and needs less redistribution. So if we shape the context to reduce the need for welfare, we need to do a lot more things than, than just a welfare system. We have to respond to the changes in the nature and the number of jobs. 
globalization has offshored the jobs, automation has reduced the jobs, higher skills are now required for well-paid jobs, and massive badly paid service jobs are what's really marking our economies now. So what would you have to do? Well, first of all, we need policies to promote smart green lifestyles. We need to lift the salary floors. There is no way we can accept the low salaries that, pe that such important people are receiving today. We need to open and broaden lifetime education. Education has to be as simple as going to the movies. I mean, education shouldn't be this very complicated administrative thing where you have to have a degree of this or that. We have to open that. Education has to be a really open thing for everybody to go up to train to do to to be in, have different skills and to change we have to widen the health system the care the health the mental health all those things and and a different customized personalized uh, community thing a much more complex not just the medical sort of part we need a local job guarantee, possibly like it's being uh, like it's being proposed by Stephanie Kelton and Paulina Cherneva, etc. I mean, we have to invent all sorts of. This is this is the innovation process. It's the process of creating answers to the things that have changed. But those answers are not just responding, not just adapting. We're shaping the technology. We're shaping the changes that are happening. Then we have. The I'm gonna have to cut you off soon. Can you wrap up in yeah. 30 seconds or so? Otherwise, we won't have time seconds. for the others. Yeah. Sorry. So we need to respond to the changes in the forms of employment. The uh, we ended the jobs for life, increasing instability and mobility, the proliferation of self-employment and the gig economy. So we need to the policies to promote smart green production methods, widening the space for profitable innovation and investment, green production policy at the local level universal basic income etc and taking advantage of the power of technology and its paradigm uh, the forced austerity and outsourcing have made governments bureaucratic and inefficient the welfare system has become humiliating so we need to adopt new models of efficiency and agility if we did ubi from atms and those who don't need it return it in taxes we wouldn't have the humiliation we make public services as easy as Amazon, borrow, invest, and innovate with boldness, empower the civil service, local governments, and the community, attract the most innovative and those with skills for dealing with people, not for handling papers and numbers, and so on. So by building a better society within a decent and ethical form of capitalism, Welfare 5.0 can concentrate on empowering people to realize their full potential, in a system that offers space for welcoming everybody's contribution. These are times for massive and bold institutional innovation and Hillary Cotton's proposals are a great step in the good direction. Thank you so much, Carlotta. You as well, what a tour de force. And it was fantastic also how you integrated the, uh, the, the recent work of Gabriel Palma precisely on that distinction between different types of inequality and how it really shows that the welfare state is being wasted in some ways. Its energy, its imagination is wasted in just redistributing what is made very problematic by, by the real economy, by having precisely those problems around finance and, and shareholder maximization in terms of the only uh, priority of the corporate sector. But I think what Hillary brings to the table, and I'm about to open up, of course, to our other two speakers, is that the distribution side, it's not so much that it shouldn't just focus on distribution. The distribution side needs as much energy and imagination and, and creativity as possible. So there's different ways, actually, to redistribute. Um, and OK, so uh, Anne-Marie, uh, I know you have collaborated a lot with Hillary in different areas, but also specifically on this paper. And that your own work, which you've written about in um, different books, and I know you have some uh, uh, new works coming out now on redesigning institutions is absolutely critical in this area. And specifically, you've written about how we need to cling to our humanness, what uh, Hillary uh, talked about in terms of sapiens integra, at a time when the world's actually becoming more and more techno technologically driven and in many ways alienated. So can you tell us in your... Uh, uh, amount of time, what your thoughts are about Hillary's paper, and maybe also reflecting on how you've collaborated. Absolutely. 
So I do not have slides. I will just talk to all of you directly. Good. But I have to start by saying that uh, reading Hillary is so deeply inspirational. When I first got hold of Radical Help, uh, it was about it was before our transatlantic flight, and I I I didn't put it down the entire flight. Uh, and meeting Hillary and, and combining the power of those ideas with the actual work she's done uh, for me has been one of the greatest tonics of the past uh, two years, really. Uh, it's been two years since, since we met. These are the kind of ideas we need, uh, both in the United States, in, Euro in, in Britain, in Europe, different forms. Uh, and my conversation will be a little more uh, American. Uh, but but it is really re rethinking human nature, rethinking institutions, as Carlotta says that when you look at the scale of her transformations. So I want to I want to focus specifically on care and institutions. Uh, but I want to begin actually with a question I think Paul Atherton raised in the Q and A, which is the the point about welfare certainly in the United States having a very bad connotation, maybe less so in in, in Britain, but. What Hillary is saying is it's wealth and welfare. I find it so powerful in this report that she says our aim is wealth. For the United States, the gospel of wealth, Andrew Carnegie, all of that, everybody loves wealth. But the point is that wealth is richness. Wealth is the richness of life. And that is far beyond money. And indeed, yes, we do need a basic threshold of living. We know that. Uh, but we also know through lots and lots of work that once you meet people's not just basic needs, but needs, then there are so many other ways in which we can be enriched. Uh, and so I want to start with that because I think of this report as wealth and welfare because Hillary's concept of welfare is wealth. In the United States, we use well-being because people don't like welfare, but it, the point is the same. So that takes you to Sapiens Integra. And the Sapiens Integra is a human being whose wealth is defined, whose well-being is defined in terms of connections to others as well as advancing our individual goals. I think women get this particularly because we, we traditionally have been defined too much by our connections to others. We have been daughters, wives, sisters, right? It, the, we have fought to be able to be individuals, to be able to have our own goals, to pursue them as all human beings do want, although in different measure. <laughs> Very, but Sapiens Integra is somebody who wants both. Who, who is defined by both, who is enriched by both. And as Hillary says, and she and I did work on this uh, together, I've done a lot of work on care. My definition of care actually comes from Milton Meyendorf, who's a philosopher who wrote a book called uh, On Caring in 1971. And he says, care is self-actualization through the growth and development of others. In other words, when your child, when your uh, student, when your mentee, when the person you manage, when they succeed because you have poured something of what you are into them, but you've also stood back and let them be who they are, you are enriched. And that is a fundamental human need. But our systems do take, care, take account only, as, as Hillary said, of that uh, competitive individualist being. It is both. Uh, and so there's a question about uh, does that does that mean to what extent does that that intersect commodification and uh, beings in capitalism? I think we can remake capitalism on these grounds, but we need not, right? We can go beyond capitalism also. The point is we start whole. The other point I want to talk about, I've got only a minute more, uh, is the, is the point about institutions uh, and particularly. Uh, how we build human connection into institutions. We move from hierarchy to network. That has been happening. I was looking at Carlotta, I'm thinking for 30 years uh, in, in, the, in, uh, in, in business, we've been talking about moving from hierarchy to network, similarly in the civic sphere. But we need a set of institutions that do connect people, but connect people in a much more distributed way, a much flatter way, and as Hillary's shown in her work, and I think Emmy will talk about, in a far more participatory way. 
So these institutions are, they're still institutions, they're connected, they, they, have, they have social weight, they have uh, a, an ability to shape society, but they're flatter and more distributed. Last quick point, and I mentioned that women are, I think, uh, deeply receptive to this way of thinking. I think it's fabulous that we are five women here and I'm honored to be on the panel with the, the, the breadth and depth of thinking uh, that we represent. Uh, women respond to this, but I'm not sure that it's biology so much as sociology. I think women respond, in part, our job has been caring, uh, but we have not had a chance to do other things. We want to do both. But we also think much more horizontally often. And I think we do so not because of who we are genetically, but like all groups who haven't held power, we find our power much more through connection and solidarity to others. So what I'd like to leave you with is that this welfare 5.0 is particularly suited for the countries we are becoming, for the far more pluralist and inclusive societies, many, many of whom have had the experience of not having power and finding meaning and power in connection with others. And I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you so much, Anne Marie. I've written down almost everything you said because I find it so inspiring, especially now, but not only now, this idea of self-actualization from the growth and development of others. I think we've all witnessed this in our streets right now and so much uh, need, there, there was so much need really for solidarity um, and, it, and it wasn't, as, um, as Hillary mentioned, an act of charity. It was very much about strengthening our own uh, community through that. So, um, Imi, it's, it's been fantastic to be interacting with you over the last two days in preparation for this. And I know that for about 10 years, you've actually worked closely with citizens to build civic spaces and social infrastructure. Um, and you've also worked closely with Hillary. Uh, so in your experience, particularly in this time of COVID-19, but not only, what do you think the communities on the ground want in terms of a social revolution of the kind that Hillary writes about? Amazing. Um, thank you so much. Um, for those of I've seen a little bit of what's going on on Twitter because um, I'm going last. So for those of you wondering what on earth it feels like to be on a panel with the people whose work you use to inspire your work, it's both terrifying and exhilarating. So um, yeah, I'm a bit nervous, but wonderful to be here. Thank you so much uh, for having me. And, and yeah, I, I love those, all of the contributions. And what got me thinking just in that last moment was... Um, maybe Sapiens Integra goes beyond the gender binary um, into, a, into another space, into a space that we don't yet understand that is also, we know, very marginalised and looking to find its power. And perhaps it goes even further than that. So I really like that last little, little bit from you as well, Anne-Marie. I guess all the big questions for me here are some of um, actually often the simple ones. And I, I kind of want to not shy away from this because we have been in the middle of uh, a global uh, Black Lives Matter uprising um, through COVID-19. And I shared a video in my Twitter for, for some of you to watch whenever you have time, um, this incredibly powerful and devastating video um, by a black woman in America who talks about the social con contract as completely broken, as crumbling the basic idea that there was enough for everyone, that the rules of the game were fair. And if you did certain things, this is what would happen in return. And we've got each other's backs. Um, and when we break the rules that there was an accountability that it was forced is, is crumbling. My generation, um, you know, very much the story that we believe we were told and sold is not one that is now true. And we're rediscovering and refinding our feet and what that looks like. Through all the work in this panel and in the partners and colleagues we work with, some of you might know Dark Matter Labs and Zero Zero, you know, we know um, through Mariana's work, through all the work Carlotta has done, we know where value is being created we know where it's being uh, extracted. We know where there isn't an equitable fair share being repaid. Um, and we know that what we're experiencing right now is um, fundamentally corrupt, right? This isn't just a Facebook and Twitter have caused us a few problems, so we're all fighting. But even 10 to 15 years ago when I was at school, you did something as a minister, you had accountability, you maybe resigned, you perhaps didn't work again, you maybe went to prison. Um, you, something happened as a result of, the, of, of what was happening. And what feels like is happening right now, and I hear it so much, 
and I think it's contributing to this deep mistrust at a local community level. Um, it's sometimes like a bit of a football match where, you know, if you commit a foul and the referee doesn't see, you get away with it. But then when the other team commits a foul and gets away with it, they don't think, oh, I got away with it. They thought, well, he got away with it, so now I can get away with it. And it feels like this is just like catching speed to the point where, you know, every single day at a local level in our communities, people who I believed we were on a collective fight are now uh, talking about COVID being a conspiracy. It's not even real. You know, not, it's not some strange conspiracy theory. This is a deep mistrust with every single thing that's happening, even your neighbor's experience. Um, and so for me, you know, that's at the heart of the work um, that we're really interested in, in doing, what it means to really re rebuild that. Um, in the popular culture, um, welfare has become this thing about money. It's become about, you know, money that is being stolen by immigrants, that there's not enough to go around. There's a lack of, um, of doctors and schools because people are taking this money from us and this real fundamental lack of abundance. And it's just a sort of lefty liberal fight to try and save it. And I think that this is a real challenge at the everyday level at, uh, in, in neighborhoods and cities all over the place. And so I just want you to imagine for a second, right? Just close your eyes wherever you are. Um, how does someone doing practice work like me talk to you about 10 years work of deep, relational, beautiful work that you feel and experience? But imagine you're standing in the center of your neighborhood and you're wandering down the road and you see a bunch of small sites that were previously overgrown and underloved. And there's a community housing project on one of them. There's growing on another one. One's been turned into a pop-up park. You turn another corner and you see a local maker factory uh, where parts are being made by communities who are building their own homes in self-build communities. There's jobs happening. People are learning new modern making methods around neighborhood retrofit. You walk around a different street and the whole streets come together to retrofit their road and they're getting parts from the local pop-up factory and they're getting new jobs through that pop-up factory. And then you turn another corner and you see a developer who's put up a sign outside about the new scheme where they are sharing the land value uplift with the citizens and the people who create it locally, not just giving us crumbs back through a shitty section 106 that nobody even understands what happened with it. And you come back, right, back around the corner to sit down for a coffee uh, and you're chatting about all the great changes that have happened in your neighbourhood. Well, that absolute small project that I just talked to you about there is the sort of thing that we're building in Birmingham Free Civic Square. Looking at how this regenerative recovery of jobs, of retrofit, of housing, of small sites have started to change the rules and the codes of the game so that development and other things can be a more equitable and shared endeavour where we all share in the value that we create. Now, I'm not going to pretend that we're looking at all the nitty gritty or the nerdy stuff behind that. Our partners at Dark Matter, at Open Systems Lab, Indy Johar, Alistair Parvian have been working with us for years on this work. And I definitely uh, would, would signpost you there. But this idea that that theory and that practice come together in this beautiful way where we can start to rebuild trust, rebuild that social contract with all the micro ha actions that happened at a neighborhood level, for me are equally as important as all of the work that is happening at a scale to change the global rules of the game, the national rules of the game. And I say that because that is where it's felt, that's where it's experienced, that's where communities come together and start to really rebuild that trust, that there is an abundant future, that democracy, I like to bring it, build, um, believe that democracy begins at home, that the future is not a zero sum one that's already decided, that there are many futures that they are to be created and imagined and developed together. And I'm just going to finish with a last little bit here because I think that this trust and this contract and the micro actions of our everyday, our collective rules, the, what we do with how we finance these spaces, how we come together is, is incredibly important as we go into a future that is very uncertain. Um, I think rebuilding this trust between the known and the unknown over this massive sort of river of uncertainty. Trust is that bridge. Trust is the thing that we have to do locally. Trust is the thing that helps to experience people, experience that future um, together. So I just don't think that inequality, mistrust, wealth extraction, the divide between the takers and the makers, the con cognitive dissonance around what what our wealth and recent history is based on can just define, it might define our presence, 
but it present, but it isn't our fate at all. And through the middle of lockdown, we ran a festival, which Hilary talked about, called the Department of Dreams. It was right in the middle of the BLM uprising. We were about to cancel it because it felt hugely um, disrespectful to talk about imaginations, dreams, futures, what we all do in the middle of such global pain, particularly for the black community. Um, and thousands of people in, uh, joined us to dream, to imagine, to create, to through their micro actions and rebuilding their relationships with each other um, start to imagine new futures. And I think that this is at the heart of some of the really important things that we need to do at a local level where we connect practice and theory together in this ever changing uh, an ever uh, developing experiment where we keep building that trust and that new social contract and the codes in practice as well as changing the rules of the game which thankfully so many of you are doing such incredible work on so we just get to say hey can we have a bit of this and a bit of this and a bit of this but I think building it in parallel and having these places where you can experience the future not just have to believe it on paper um, like Kate Rayworth says, the e economics of the 21st century are, are going to be practiced first and perhaps theorized later or maybe theorized even at the same time. I think it's really important that we keep investing in that space. And for those of you who are sitting at, and will be shouting at the screen because I hear it loads saying, Imi, you know, retrofitting one street or one micro factory or 100 small sites in a part of Birmingham doesn't change um, the, the bigger picture. I completely agree with that. We know we need to retrofit thousands of homes every day just to get up to what we need to meet for the 2030 standards. But without what we're doing, we don't experience that cohesion, that trust, that experimentation, that flow of learning between us all, that this is working, this is not working. We've managed to persuade this developer, this local authority is invested in this. Without that, we continue to create a gulf where people experience something very different to what we're hoping and visioning for the future, often um, not embedded within communities. So I hope that you'll look up Civic Square and see a little bit of what we're doing, but we'll talk about probably many other examples as we have the chat. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Emmy. Wow, um, I'm definitely gonna get in touch with you because we've just set up a commission here in my part of London, the Camden Renewal Commission with Georgia Gould, and we're very much trying to base it precisely on the street, for, you know, particular areas. What can we learn also in terms of ownership? Um, your expression, the everyday collective is fantastic. And I just wanted to use that expression actually to feed back a first question um, to Hillary. Hillary, we're gonna have to be super brief if we wanna go through um, some of the questions that have come from the chat. But just before we go there, we haven't really used yet the word ownership um, in this discussion. And I just want you to be able to just tell us what you think in terms of, you know, does it matter uh, whether it's public or private? Surely the answer is sort of, <laughs> or sometimes completely. Um, but what have you written about this? Where does ownership fit in your welfare state 5.0? And given that Emmy just talked about the everyday collective, when we think about collective, we might also think of cooperatives and mutual trusts, if we think also about historical forms. If you could just say something about ownership before we go. Yes, so one thing I want to say is that the questions are fantastic. And um, I do have an email on my website and you can email me and we're not going to get through them, but I, I wish I could kind of immediately get in dialogue with all the questions. So ownership, look, this work is about power and ownership is, you know, fundamental to that kind of question. Um, you know, I think so. And I think that one of the things that I find really interesting in Carlotta's work is the way that she talks about how things like um, cooperatives become reinvented in a new technology revolution. And we're seeing that we're seeing this huge interest in cooperatives right now. Um, I think that, the you know, um, Emmy and her colleagues really tackle the idea which is so critical in the UK about who's owning owning land and so on. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think um, that this is really, really fundamental. And I think, you know, that perhaps I think the part of the paper that lots of people find quite difficult is that I am absolutely saying that the kinds of institutions that offer the kind of support we need in 5.0 are in a separate kind of economy, which is not extractive, which is owned in a different way by communities and workers. And we, we can have multiple models. It's not going to be that it's this one model. But as you referred to, um, you know, the, the old sort of care beds, you know, I mean, that is really a scandal that happens now. Those care beds are in private equity. Um, 
the, the workers are paid minimum wage. The owner of most of them in the UK lives off site in the Isle of Man and cannot even attend board meetings. So he'd have to pay tax. And now he's started a massive British foundation through which he's going to recycle his reputation and his money um, to make everything look great. And, and this is the kind of circle that we can't have. We have to have completely the kind of reverse of that circle, thinking yeah. really fundamentally about ownership. And Anne-Marie might want to say something about this, because I think that the way in New America as well, you're thinking about different ways of connecting to community around these questions is also, is also really important, the practice of New America. Uh, so. I'll just say in very quickly, I mean, this is something I think we're seeing in lots of places, but, it's, but the, this idea, Again, that instead of having smart people sit in a room like a tank, a uh, think tank, and come up with ideas and then try to, to get them passed and then implemented and then discover that the people you were trying to serve don't like them, don't want them, don't, don't need them, you have to start there. You have to start with the actual people who may be having the problem you think they're having or may not, but they are the ones who need to be at the heart of the process. Uh, and then there's an enabling process to provide voice uh, and build trust, exactly as Zimmy said. Okay, so I'm gonna read off three questions and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna sort of ask you all three to, to react to them, um, probably in the order of the one that's most relevant. So the first one, I think probably um, Anne-Marie and, um, and Hillary, and I'll get to Emmy and some of the following ones. Um, is Sapiens Integra, this concept that you both have talked about, still rooted in the capitalist system, or do you also envision more spaces of decommodification for her? This is a question from Rebecca Leicht. Um, why don't I just let you react quickly to that? I think it's hard if I start reading off too many. You literally have 30 seconds each. <laughs> Hillary, you go first, because I, okay. I took a crack so, at it. Oh, so, I mean, what I, th I think that there are, I, this is a relation, it is really important to kind of decommodify is what I would say. So if we think about relationships, you know, when I first started talking about relationships, um, there was a question kind of raised in policy circles about how we could commission a relationship. So in other words, how could we buy a relationship through our services? And I think that one of the things that's, that's really important in the discussions that Anne-Marie and I have been having is that relationships are for relationships sake. They're not just transactional about how I can get from A to B. Of course, that's part of it. We know, I mean, in the work that I've done that people who have got uh, deep and wide relationships find good work and people who don't don't find good work and don't progress in work but I think it's absolutely about kind of rethinking that which leads then into not only for the person their relationships but if we think about what do education systems look like what does learning look like if we think that it's not just to be the kind of cog in the wheel I mean I, I'm amazed that students have gone back to school in this country and there's this whole thing about that they're three months behind now I don't want to minimize that in many of the communities I work in that means that children haven't had uh, lunches or kind of you know they'd be living in small and cramped spaces but three months behind what three months behind kind of learning some rote uh, learning that's going to be fed into an exam I mean this is not what we would think about learning if we place sapiens integra at the kind of center of our systems I would agree and I would just add though that it within some kind of economic system I don't care what we what we call it but we are seeing the rise of a, a much broader care economy. Again, if care is self-actualization through investment in others or, or, or caring for others, you're seeing coaches and navigators and counselors and guides. There are all these new jobs that are really important jobs that we need to value that are exactly about helping others, giving them a platform, teaching them, ultimately enabling their autonomy and their relationships to others beyond. So that's a, a vision of a care economy going forward. I think that's so okay. important. Well, I'm gonna interrupt you, otherwise oh. we're gonna get Emmy back in. I, I need to bring Emmy back in. So Emmy, there's one that's directly to you, but I'm also gonna ask you another one. One says, Emmy, I love your work and the community voice that you bring to the reality. Um, so the question, which I'm trying to read properly, says to all which interconnections between communities, investment and social change, we need more data to, to actually quicken the feedback loop that our politicians need to make change a priority towards working towards these social uh, urgent issues. So could you just maybe reflect a bit on what you've been thinking around the data and the digital kind of issues at the community level that you're working with? Yeah, so there's there's tons of stuff here. I'm not. I have no way I can talk about it all. You know, what one thing is um, civic data trust. What are we doing with our data? 
what happens at a local level? Do people even know what is happening? We have 5G conspiracy theories on every street in Birmingham because people actually don't know where their data is going, where it's being mined, what's happening with it. So, you know, how do we collectively, like everything else, own stuff? How do we deliberate about that? What do we do with data is one of one of those questions in hundreds of other ways you know we we've been working on that sort of stuff with our small sites projects using data to unlock communities in being able to imagine what can happen in their places understand who owns what's around them uh, you know what the leverage points of making change in their places are and then i'd probably default to our partners open systems lab and dark matter who were doing much more structural stuff in that data space there so yeah absolutely crucial tons of different things we tend to try and work at the what the neighborhood scale um organizing deliberating owning deciding what happens and um I can't remember the term you use now, Hilary. Sorry, you know that my memory is a bit of a, a, a problem. Um, the, yep, the term can't have yeah, it now. <laughs> uh, we, we both we both had a we both had a head injury at the same time, and uh, we both recovered from it at the same time. Oh, so wow, it's, it's quite funny. But um, something about uh, building capacity in people. So actually, stop stopping um, thinking that they people can't understand what's going on, but actually giving you know and sharing and making knowledge more open more transparent so people can actually start to talk about well hold on a second what's what's happening when i put my details into that covid app or what's happening when amazon delivered this to me or you know and so that's a key part of our role but of course like i've said with everything else there's a whole stack of work here and that isn't the only role when it comes to data so um yeah hope yeah. that's a little bit helpful Great. Um, another one uh, I want to read out is about mental health, which um, we know is, is, is a huge issue. It says, I'm a social worker. So this is Tom Pollard. I'm a social worker and a policy expert on mental health. My ability to help the people I support is constantly undermined, constrained by systemic forces. How much progress towards the vision that Hillary has set out do the panel think we can make from the bottom up under a government that seems intent to returning to business as usual. And maybe in answering that, Hillary, can you also give us an example around mental health, the kind of status quo way of thinking about mental health, and then the practice on the ground that maybe you've either witnessed or, ex or experimented with in terms of new types of mental health services coming from a redesigned welfare uh, point of view? 30 seconds for something immensely complex. I mean, one thing I think is that if you're, and I know Tom does amazing work and knows this, but if you're trying to do uh, bottom up work, the thing is to be in a team and to get yourself somewhere where there's a team, because one thing for sure, no individual can kind of make this kind of change. Um, I, I have, I mean, I think mental health is, as we know, the Cinderella of all systems. We know, you know, whether it's children's services or adult services in the UK, I think, you know, in the US, I see Anne-Marie nodding. Um, and, and what is the challenge of mental health? I mean, the challenge of mental health is, is living in these punitive systems that leave most people behind, that make it completely impossible to kind of, you know, raise a family with not, without decent housing, without, um, you know, a job that has a kind of decent wage floor like Carlotta was talking about. So in my work, every single person I work with has some form of mental health problem because they're trying to live in a way that, that none of us could survive. And I, I mean, I write about this in Radical Health, you know, I mean, family life is very very difficult and some of us are lucky enough to have you know a, a decent income and, and things that paper over the cracks but but these are very difficult things for everybody so I think that um, this is a very big conversation and I don't in the in the case of mental health I don't think that we can solve the mental health problems we have through thinking about how we can continually fund I mean this goes to Carlotta's graphs better and better mental health systems. We have to start with good work, with housing, and then actually has happened in Gateshead, really importantly. I mean, Gateshead, um, somebody, uh, uh, Mark, oh, Mark, your name, your full name is gone in the kind of pressure, like Emmy is saying, of kind of, but, but I mean, Mark's work, what he did was he saw, you know, thousands of people in Gateshead with mental health problems. So he said, okay, I want to meet everybody and I want to find out like what your challenge is. And then once he had kind of worked through all the challenges of decent housing work and, you know, family support and support with that and so on, he then had an absolutely tiny number of people that actually needed a, any kind of formal mental health service. And lo and behold, actually Gateshead had the resource to really support those families. So, I mean, it's, it's immensely complex. I mean, you suggested that people email my husband who kind of works in a CAM service and, you know, most people who, who present in his service can't begin to talk because their housing is so poor and they can't get over that initial problem. So this is immensely complex. 
Yep. And let's let, and this is why this is goes really to the heart of welfare 5.0 that if we start to think that we can solve mental health services, you know, all of this through a mental health service, this is not about just thinking mm. about services. I mean, I know that Tom knows that and I know that his work yep. is excellent. And, and also, of course, he's raising a bigger challenge. What do we do every day? We have to do something. Anyway. We only have one minute left. I'm not sure if something happens, the whole thing shuts down or if we're allowed to go over and some people like myself can go up and feed my four children who are yelling. But <laughs> question by Cassie Robinson, which I think would be great if all three of you, four of you, sorry, could just answer really quickly because I think it's fundamental to a lot of the literature we see in this area and then the practice. What is civil society? Why do we use this word to mean kind of everything but business and government? So this is a question from Cassie Robinson. How are you defining civil society? I think it's important that we have a better sense of what we mean by that. She says that Alistair Parvin talks about the citizen sector. So not the market, not the state or the professionalized third sector. Is that what you mean? So can we start with um, Imi, then Anne-Marie, Carlotta and Hillary? What do we mean by civil society? Look, I, um, Cassie knows that I um, pretty much get drowned in all the definitions that go around um, about what we're talking about here. But what we're talking about is a sort of micro massive uh, civic movement at neighbourhood levels where we are looking at um, lots and lots of small um, participatory connected uh, micro civic actions and organisations. And when we think about change and we think about um, who who is an actor in that it's it's everyone right from business to government and it's about how we know no single one is an actor how do we come to the table and understand what our roles are and how do we redefine them and redistribute them and maybe remove some of them in the future but what i'm essentially talking about in the micro infrastructures connected together to wider structures um, that then look at um, you know how we uh, sort of have a revolution from the ground up but not the ground up only right not the ground up only that meets in the middle with all the other different things we know uh, is Carlotta talks about in massive societal progression so yeah I kind of not even interested in these definitions if I'm honest <laughs> I'm not sure I can do any better than that I agree, <laughs> <laughs> I agree with the frustration and and uh, I mean, there's just so many different um, members of civil society. And in the United States, we talk about the nonprofit sector, which brings in universities and hospitals and you name it. Uh, I, I think I would talk about entities that are working in the public interest. Uh, and but I would also really make a different there a conception of the public interest. I would also really distinguish between grassroots and grass tops and argue that that I think I agree that defining is less important at the moment than than genuinely engaging. Are trade unions part of civil society? We used to talk about capital labor relations. If we put them under this big minestrone soup of civil society, are we depoliticizing and de? I mean. Are they? I don't know. Or, anyway, move on. <laughs> They're nonprofits. <laughs> I would argue that we should go back to using concrete words like labor. Anyway. <laughs> no, I just think active citizenship of all sorts, which are not formally, you know, which are not formal organizations. I would say just mm -hmm. this participation at levels. Yeah, but I've spoken yep. too much. I'm really, I'm really worried about having taken so much space. So shut up, Carlotta. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, no. If you want, we can stay till nine. In fact, exactly. <laughs> we can eat together. It's, that work is foundational. <laughs> yeah. Well, we yes. Um, I mean, I in my four categories, I do have unions in civil society. In the work I do, I definitely draw a distinction between actual grassroots activism of the type Imi is talking about versus the very big third sector organizations that are very much in the kind of 1950s vertical organization and work in a different way. But I mean, some of the most interesting work that's happening here in the UK is happening in East Ayrshire, where um, Katie Kelly and her team, her community team, have started to think about the role of the state through labor, through saying, you know, our workers are actually our civil society. Why don't we start to kind of rethink the connections in that way? And, and what's happened there in terms of community, in terms of public service is really, really interesting. So for me, what matters now is the kind of fluidity of these boundaries. And it's complex because we have to keep power in view at the same time. But um, I, yes, 
I, I yeah. think that what's exciting is when we begin to kind of blend in this way. Yeah, we're working currently with um, Sweden on one of its big missions, which has to do with the welfare state. It's a fossil free welfare state mission nationally, which then gets um, landed down to very concrete things like school meals, but basically everything the state provides from public transport to public health. And what's interesting, if you think about the whole climate movement is recently, at least on the labor <coughs> side, there's been this concept of the just transition. And as important as it is, which is basically that as you transit from a fossil fuel generated economy to a greener one, many people are left behind. So they need to be invested in kind of a sapiens interga also uh, lends to it. However, coming back to reimagining and redesigning the welfare state, one of the limits of that perspective is that the just transition assumes that someone defines the transition, you know, the experts, businesses, uh, governments, uh, academics, and then labor has to say, hey, 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 hold on, make sure it's just as opposed to bringing those different voices of different civic uh, movements and society to the table ex ante to even define what's, you know, what's sustainability? What do we mean by a carbon neutral city? What does it mean for the future of mobility? So bringing genuine new and different voices, race, class, gender uh, to the table ex ante to define exactly what you're talking about in that. Need well, to and, be that, and that represent. is what my current practice is all about, which is, you mm. know, in the, in the world of work is that we have to understand that in many nations, I mean, in the US and the UK, that good work, well paid, good work is is dirty work in the kind of green transition yeah. and that we can't possibly expect kind of mass support for a green transition unless we kind of grapple with that and we think about it in terms of transition incomes in terms of thinking about collaborative processes to design as you say not saying not turning up in a place yeah. i work in you know communities where we say oh well sorry you know as part of the green transition your work's gone what's going to happen yeah. now i totally yeah. agree with you that has to be absolutely at the heart of our work going forward so listen, unfortunately, time's up. But what we're going to do is we're going to save all the questions, right. <laughs> not only send them to Hillary, but put them perhaps, I mean, we could also do a selection. I'm not sure if we can do them all. Put them on the IPP website near the event space of this talk. You're, you said your email, well, your email is shared in that. Well, anyway, we'll, we'll figure out how people can. Yeah, my, the, I have a specific email, Mariana, before you share my email. On my website, there is an email <laughs> that I use. Um, and I, of course, I get thousands of emails and it has a bounce back, but I do eventually read them all and I will yeah. respond. So if you go on hillarycotton.com or you follow me on Twitter, you'll find a way to connect with me. Yeah, sorry. I was mainly just referring to your point in the beginning that you want this to be an emerging document. You Absolutely. want this to be a live document. I think that's fantastic. We are so honored, Hillary, that you are working with us, that you are also teaching on our courses to the civil servants of the future. Um, so thank you so much to this really star panel, Anne-Marie, Emmy, Carlotta, Hillary, and all the back people there. You don't see them, but there's about 10 people who've helped make this happen, as well as all our uh, seminars that we have um, around these kind of issues of public purpose, public value, and how to really bring back agency to all the questions of governance, both within public, private, and those interrelationships. So thank you, everyone. I hope you, you all have so a gin and much. tonic or something ready for you near your, your, your computer. <laughs> Thank you all. It's such an honor. Yeah, it's Thank an you. honor for me. Thank you, everybody. And I look forward to building the next stage with you all. Great. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye.